It's really good to be able to talk about friendship across faiths. And actually, it's particularly good today. Uh, during the filming of this, you may hear some uh, background noises of sirens. There's been a violent incident in London today, quite close to where we are. And um, so there is some background noise, for which apologies if it uh, disrupts a little. But it's a reminder of the importance of starting with and creating friendships. Uh, friendships across faith are the key to beginning to work out how we deal with difference. We don't deal with difference by pretending it doesn't exist. We deal with it by building relationships. My own experience has been very varied. It's, I suppose, the, one of the earliest of the close friendships I had uh, was with some imams in Nigeria when I was doing some mediation work there and just finding myself more and more sitting down with Islamic religious leaders in Nigeria, asking them questions, them asking me questions and just saying quite openly to each other, well, what causes these things to happen, some of the violent incidents we were dealing with. And um, I would say to, I remember one of them, a particular friend, I said, look, I know you're committed to peace, but some of your colleagues aren't. If you were them, how would you justify violence and how can you tell me why your justification is wrong? So we were at a very honest level. And then since being Archbishop, because lots of other relationships have developed, among those with whom I relate most closely are the chief rabbi uh, of the Commonwealth who lives in London and we had dinner together last week. Very frank, honest, uh, I mean he's an extraordinary man. Um, leaders of the Islamic community and later today I'll probably be on the phone to one of those saying you will write uh, following instance today, um, you know, because people always cause there's always tension at moments like this and, and it's been for me a particular pleasure to build these relationships two quick examples to finish with last autumn in English terms last October I think it was I was in Abu Dhabi and uh, meeting Islamic religious leaders we had tough honest conversations which deepened our friendship. Friendship doesn't mean avoiding big issues. And um, more recently, uh, meeting with, uh, during Lent, which is in Christian terms, the period running up to Easter when you're meant to prepare with fasting and reflection and that kind of thing. Uh, meeting with uh, an imam, who's become a friend, and me sharing a bit from the Christian scriptures, him sharing something from the Quran, and again, very honest conversations, not pretending we agreed, but recognizing humanity in each other. But through these conversations, I've been enriched in numerous ways. First of all, is just simply with friendship, uh, with food, <laughs> And then it goes with food, uh, lifts my spirits a bit. Um, what I've been enriched with most, uh, the, the sort of deep thing, is an understanding of profound religious faith commitment in others, which has forced me back to examine myself more closely, to listen more carefully. And that's been the principal source of enrichment. If I were thinking about the call to what everyone can do in this area, what would I say? I think I'd say you get further with food than with most things. So let's be really down to earth about it. Yesterday evening, my wife and I visited a refugee family, Muslim, who are living here at Lambeth. And so what do we do? We share a cup of coffee and some fruit. Um, we give them uh, an Easter, a chocolate Easter bunny. 
I mean, it, it's not complicated. Um, I would say to everyone, start with sharing what we all share, which is the pleasure of conversation. It could be football, about football. It could be about sport generally. It could be whatever. But very often a bit of food does no harm. Talking about family, understanding each other's humanity by relating to the fact that we have people whom we love and we have things which we love and we have activities which we love and surprise, no surprise, very often what someone of a different faith loves in terms of activity is very, very similar to what we love. When you talk in the um, very secularized West about knowledge of faith traditions, one starts with the reality that an awful lot of people have very little knowledge of any particular faith tradition nowadays. That's how the world has changed in much of Europe. Um, and uh, in some other places, not, not much elsewhere, but in, in some other places. So I think one of the most important things is get to know your own faith tradition first, because there's an old legal expression that you can't give what you haven't got. It's actually in Latin, but I can't remember how that one works. So know what the tradition of your own country is. It might not be your own faith, but if you're if you're English, born and brought up here, the historic faith in this country, every time you turn a corner you see a church, you see a cathedral, you see people on the telly. Um, so why is this story of the church so important in our history? Secondly, listen to other people's story. It's all about story. And be honest. Don't. For me, the important thing is to admit what I don't know. The most important step in working with other faiths is to move from unconscious ignorance to conscious ignorance. In other words, from saying you think you know and then realizing you don't, to saying I know that I don't know what they think and therefore the only way of finding out is to ask them. That's a very good way forward. And um, you sometimes find some very, very surprising answers. We have in England a program called Near Neighbours, very helpfully and kindly and generously sponsored by the British government, uh, working through uh, uh, an organisation linked to the Church of England called the Church Urban Fund and through dioceses in the church, that is areas uh, where there's a bishop, a church leader covering a largish area. And Near Neighbours works at bringing different faith communities together in areas where we have numerous different faith communities. One of the things that's, be that's beginning to make it work rather well, I'm sorry this is sounding like a theme that I'm obsessed with, is, is that they share meals together. <laughs> um, I mustn't mention food again. And, um, but one of the other things is they begin to find what they can do in common so, for example, you're finding them um, in areas of economic need, sharing in running food banks. You're finding them helping with night shelters for people who are homeless. You're finding them um, uh, working together on local needs with elderly people. And what that has taught me is not, this is not true for every faith, because the moment any religious leader says all faiths believe X or Y, stop listening, because they don't. One thing one can say about many faiths is that they have within them, at their heart, a sense of the existence of God. That is not true for all the major world faiths. But for many, for most, 
and they also have a deep sense of the, of the dignity of the human person. And that leads them to reach out to help people, to be with people, to be there for people. Um, and I think in my own friendships, it's that sense of recognizing that people act not out of calculation to make their faith look better, but out of a deep sense of compassion for people who are suffering. And that tells you something really, really important. And it builds very powerful bridges. I think it's a really difficult question as to what the impact of differences in faith mean. If we take faith seriously, that it's more than a lifestyle choice, which it certainly is, then for me, at the heart of my faith, is a belief in a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God through Jesus Christ, a sense of the presence of God, an expectation that when things go really wrong, that I can argue with God, protest, lament. When things go really well, I can dance and, and uh, celebrate. And that comes as a Christian because I believe that Jesus Christ is God himself. Now, if you're talking with someone who may have very similar value systems but doesn't believe that, that's obviously something you have to navigate around. You have to negotiate that. But it should not be an obstacle, but it should be a reality. And they're very, very different things. I think it is one of the things that really presses my buttons and gets me going, uh, sometimes unhelpfully, is when people say, well, you all really believe the same things. Let me give you an example. A few years ago in one of our cities in England, uh, one of the leaders of the city council, who was an atheist, got together all the faith community leaders, including a friend of mine who was the local bishop, and said, we're going to build you a common worship center so you can all worship together. And with one accord, perfectly united, they said, look, we'll serve the poor, we'll help the city, we'll support the council, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do the other. But the moment you tell us to worship together, you're saying our faith doesn't matter. That it's all some sort of dreadful soup in which everything has been mixed up. So I'm really careful about that because if I respect the dignity of another human being, I'm going to respect their differences as being as important as their similarities. Because otherwise it's to say to them, I'm a bit superior to you. And I think that's just horrible. So obstacle, no. Reality, yes. Difference enriches us when we allow ourselves to be made curious by it. When we allow it to force us to ask ourselves questions and to ask questions of the person we're with. When you meet someone who has a very different view of the world, if you get to know them reasonably well, I think you can get to the point of saying, look, but why do you look at things like this? Because within us, I hope, there's always the sense there's more to learn. There's always the sense that perhaps I am, I'm not seeing the world exactly as I ought to see it. Perhaps my vision of the world can be corrected, tweaked, shaped a little by the difference I encounter in someone else. That doesn't mean compromising on my own deeply held faith, but it does mean, mean allowing for the fact that I haven't got everything right in every way. And I think that's... I'm, I'm just thinking of the dinner I had with the chief rabbi last week. You know, we had, he was expressing a view at one point, and I've, I've been thinking about it ever since. And thinking, 
why do I not take that aspect of life more seriously? Maybe I'm just missing out on something. Maybe I need to think more about this. So that's what I mean by reality, not obstacle. It doesn't mean you don't relate. It means you can relate very, very deeply. But the reality is something that is solid in your conversation that, and, and that you hold together as a, a, something really important and therefore allow it to have an impact on you. Do you know one of the things that really strikes me at the moment more and more is with telephones, I haven't got my phone on me, but you know, these uh, smartphones, we've got information about everything and relationship with no more people than we ever had. You have a really deep relationship usually, not invariably, but usually not with people you, who are so-called Facebook friends or, you know, that you read their tweets or whatever. You have a really deep relationship with someone who you sit with. And when they ring up and say, my son's just got a job. And you say, oh, that's just amazing. And you talk about how proud they are and why they love their son. Or they ring up and say, my wife's really, really ill. And you say, oh, and you, or you see them and you put an arm around their shoulder and you, or you hold their hand and you go to the hospital with them or you send some flowers, whatever it happens to be. We have information everywhere, but relationships are as few and far between as they ever were. So the answer to that is make relationships, make friends with people from another faith. Because information without relationship is as likely to lead to enmity and fear as it is to friendship and love. And therefore, deal with it. Let's be people who show that a world that is more and more capable of knowing things and less and less capable of loving people who are different is not the world that we're going to build for our children and our grandchildren. But it's going to be a world where relationships reach out and build the bridges and our children and grandchildren inherit that world. People are incredibly cynical in many parts of the world, particularly Europe with a postmodernist, what's called postmodernist philosophy, that sense of suspicion about anyone in authority, which we've grown up with. I grew up with it, you know, it's become much more important. That sense of um, whenever you meet someone in authority or you hear them on the telly, you think, what do they really want? What power are they trying to exercise? And we're much more suspicious. But people believe us when we do things. And therefore, when we act as faith, as believers, when we act in common, when we do things together, it has about 10,000 times more effect than when we say things together. Because people think, well, words are cheap, actions cost. And I need to keep on reminding myself of this because, you know, I'm in the word job. I spend my life talking. Uh, it's one of the jokes in the family that the only time that people know that dad's really not very well is when he stops talking. And we need a... We need people in faith communities who are utterly faithful to their own actions, to their own faith, but who act in common. I can think of a place, I won't say where, because it puts them at, in some vulnerability, but a particular place I know of where I worked at one point where there'd been very, very severe killing. Between, it wasn't really over faith, but it became, faith was used as the hook to hang the, the quarrel on. And, um, it ended up, cut a long story short, it ended up with the two communities protecting each other's worship centres at times of worship and digging sewage ditches in an area which had no main drains, no way of carrying sewage away. 
And they were still arguing like crazy while they were digging. But they weren't killing each other. They were arguing at the top of their voices while they did something for the common good. Now that was really impressive interfaith action. Common prayer is one of those areas that gets people really, really antsy. Um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, <clears throat> I think it has to be done with great care not to imply that, as I said earlier, that we're some kind of common religious soup. Uh, like a stew in which you throw everything in and hope it tastes nice at the end. I think I, I'm just remembering an example, oh, possibly about a year ago, when we had prayer following some terrible incidents in the Middle East outside Westminster Abbey. And what was beautiful about that was you had different religious leaders. There was no sense that we were saying we all believe the same thing, but there was a sense that we came together each in our own tradition, faithful to our own tradition, to offer protest, lament, petition. It's not for me to say exactly what was going on there. What I do know is that there was a deep respect for difference, but a deep sense of common humanity. And it is holding those two things together that leave us, as it left me that day, going away, able to embrace everyone else who'd been there. And with a deep, a deep sense that there'd been a generosity of hospitality in our spirituality that did not compromise what we said.